NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Tax season is here, which means you've received or are expecting that tax refund any day now, and you're thinking about what to spend it on. How about a new home? With SaveWithConrad.com, we're helping renters become homeowners every single day, and it's more affordable than you think. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need a huge down payment. In fact, you may not need a down payment at all. At SaveWithConrad.com, we take the stress out of the home buying process. We'll determine your buying power. We'll even help you find a realtor. And unlike the banks, we don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. So if you're not ready right now, we'll get you on a plan to be ready. Stop throwing your money away, paying someone else's mortgage with your rent and start the path towards owning your own home today at SaveWithConrad.com. Right now, Fight Plus, the ultimate digital platform for live sports and entertainment, is offering a free seven-day trial at TryFight.com. Yes, you can access Fight Plus's incredible library full of combat sports, wrestling, and other premium content absolutely free for seven days by going to tryfight.com and the best part you can find them on all major streaming platforms available today so don't waste another second go to tryfight.com that's t-r-y-f-i-t-e.com right now and find out why they are the undisputed champ of live sports and entertainment symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hello and welcome to Arn. This is Paul Bromwell, and today I'm joined by the Hall of Famer, the founder of the Four Horsemen, the creator of the Spine Buster, and one of the two very best tag team wrestlers in the history of the business. Ladies and gentlemen, he's the enforcer. He's double A. He's Arn Anderson. Arn, how are you this week, my friend? Inching along, buddy. Uh, doing good. Uh, we went to hope you had a good uh, Easter. I did. I did. It was good. It was nice. It was quiet. So um, I, I don't mind a, a little bit of quiet time. It wasn't a big ruckus around here for our Easter, but had fun with the kids and uh, and uh, it, we had good weather. So I'm glad to see spring is is is, is on its way. How, how was your Easter, Arn? Well, good. We went to um, we went to church where Brock went to. Uh, kindergarten and preschool and all that many many years ago which is down the road from the house Calvary and okay. uh, went to the morning service and uh, got reminded what Easter was really about and uh, it's you know God and Jesus Christ are helping us through this this horrible time and uh, it's pretty clear that without him I don't know uh, it just took on a different meaning. I'm and, sure it uh, did. Yeah, really did. And, uh, it's just all part of the healing and, uh, it's going to be a long struggle, but we're, we're inching along. That was a great idea, uh, for the family to go. And it was kind of some great young memories of Brock when he was young and, you know, going to pick him up and watching him out playing on the playground and all that stuff. So it was, a uh, it was a different day and, a good day, man. It does my heart so good to hear you talk, uh, talk like that arm, because, you know, we usually just sit here and talk wrestling and, and that's what this show is all about and about your history. But also when we talk about family, we talk about faith a little bit, talk about, um, learning a little bit more about you. And we're you know, obviously now hearing Bro Brock's foundation and, uh, that you're depending on, on the Lord, you know, in, in this trying time. And, uh, you and I've talked offline about that and how we both feel. And so, man, I'm so glad to hear you say that. And, uh, and that's what the Easter season's all about. Right. And, uh, you know, so I'm glad to hear that you say that. And I know that you and Aaron and Brock's, uh, are going to still have a, a long road to travel, long road to go as far as healing. And, uh, but man, we are encouraged by you and I'm so encouraged by you. You're, you're a blessing. Uh, to so many people uh, that have been there and are going through it, and I just can't thank you enough for that. 
No, I thank you to, to you, Paul, and everyone like you, everybody that's out there that continually, it's like daily, I get well wishes and prayers, and, and uh, I'm just very, very grateful. Without the grace of all of you know God's blessings, none of this would be possible, and to him goes the glory, buddy. That's that's awesome, man. Listen, you uh, you, you are in constant prayers and thoughts of so many. Uh, I still am getting a lot of direct messages and and f- the people asking about you. Uh, just on a Zoom yesterday, and I had someone say, "Hey, can you please let Arn know that I'm, we're thinking about him, still in our thoughts and prayers?" And I said, "Absolutely, I'm recording with him tomorrow." So, uh, man, I I'm so uh, happy uh, to hear that uh, your strength uh, continues to grow and and the support. From, from all those that follow this show. Can't say thank you enough. Uh, and I hope someone commented, Ron Ward, who's a faithful listener of the show on Ad Free. First of all, he said he loves your impersonations of Larry <laughs> Zabisco and Bobby Eaton. And one day wants to have a running conversation of you playing both voices. We're going to have to do that on Ask Arn Anything. But he said, man, I hope you made out, Arn made out like a bandit when he was out on the West Coast uh, for WrestleCon and was able to walk out of there with a few Hershey bars with almonds. Did how, how was your time out there? Because we haven't gotten to talk about that. Well, I got to visit with Dean Maliko some and, and Ted DiBiase and his wife and, you know, uh, Tony Hunter, you know, and his wife who, you know, he's in charge of us. What a what a tough hand he has to play, you know, uh, from time to time. But it was just really a, a huge crowd, as you would expect it to be in L.A., you know, got to see a lot of people that I hadn't seen in a while. And, uh, you know, it was overall, it was long days, but they, they don't seem long because I'm getting to do what I always say I want to do is thank everybody for my career. And, and without all those wrestling fans out there coming from all over the country, you know, that wouldn't be a successful show. And uh, it was a very successful show. I wanted to uh, transition because speaking of su- successful shows, if you didn't get uh, your fill of Hershey bars and almonds and <laughs> seeing, seeing uh, those that want to meet you, Arn, you have another opportunity, right? Coming up as this show drops on the main feed on April 15th, you're going to be in, what, Salisbury, North Carolina for uh, Glory Days Championship Wrestling. Absolutely, Brock's Wrestling. I'm managing. We're not sure of the opponent uh, yet, but it's got, you know, it's a... Uh, 50 miles door to door. And anytime you can do that in this business, only the people in this business truly get that to get a rep in, be, uh, you know, an hour's drive away from home is just, that's a blessing. So we're really looking forward to that this Saturday. We'll be there early signing and uh, taking pictures and all that stuff. So if you can get down there to see us, please do. Check it out. Throw it into your uh, Google machine. Uh, Glory Days Championship Wrestling. It is April the 15th. Here we go, Arn. Listen to this lineup. Arn Anderson, Buff Bagwell, Magnum TA, one of my all-time favorites, The Barbarian, Lodi, Jimmy Valiant, The Boogie Woogie Man's going to be there, Sam Houston, Mad Max, Bobby Fulton, Jackie Fulton, Brock Anderson, Ernest the Cat Miller, and many more. The meet and greet is from 6 to 8 p.m., and then the wrestling begins at 8 o'clock at night. So uh, make every effort to go out and see AA, support Brock, and uh, all the rest of these guys, man. Th- these are all of our heroes and all the guys that we love to watch growing up. Pretty impressive card. That's the first time I've actually heard the entire card, so yeah. look forward to seeing all those guys. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun, I'm sure, for you just catching up with a, a lot of your former uh, co-workers and friends. And yep. so uh, support support Arn and the rest of the gang out there at Glory Days. Arn, uh, a few things that I want to mention quick. First of all, as those that are watching the YouTube video, I am wearing my brand new Four Horsemen jacket uh, for this show. And buddy, uh, we we have we've been chilling this thing since it came out, and it's no joke. I love it. It feels great. Fits fantastic. True to size. The embroidery work is fantastic. If you haven't gotten one yet, boxagimmicks.com. I know Brock's arrives today as we're recording this. Yours already arrived. How happy are you with these jackets? I'll be even happier if you're, you'll turn out, stand up, and turn around. Let me see the back. I'll, 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 my or headphones just, are going to come out, but hold on. Nice. Now that is true Arne, to form. Could you, uh, could you see the logo there? True to form, buddy. True to form. 
that's that's the work I was looking for. That's something I'd be proud to wear, and, and I am. I've got mine. Got a red one and a black one, and uh, worn it a few times around, and got got noticed actually a little bit. Hey man, I like that jacket. And then they look, <laughs> they look a little closer and go, I'll be damned. You, you, yeah, yeah, that should be. Uh, I, listen, I, I, this thing is so nice. It could have been your Easter Sunday sport coat, pal. Okay, you could whack a little tie and dress shirt with it, and and you know throw on the old horseman jacket. I mean, come on. Yeah, why not? <laughs> no, it, it, it looks really good, and it's and it, the main thing is it's comfortable, and uh, you know it's not too hot, and, it, and if it's a little bit cool where you are, it's warm enough. So. Check them out. Go to boxagimmicks.com. Grab you a uh, horseman jacket. Grab you a horseman hat and uh, support the enforcer. We're going to talk about the comic book towards the end because uh, I, I want to get into the show this week, man. There is a lot to cover here. It is February 1992. Arn, the last time we recorded, we talked about how you and beautiful Bobby, Eaton, one of your best friends in all the world, became tag team champions together. And uh, you remember, uh, as we talked about it, you guys had defeated Rick the Dragon, Steamboat, and Dustin Rhodes. And with that victory, Arn, the two best tag team wrestlers in history of the business became champions together. And man, what a special moment for you. Uh, as you look back on it, and as we're reliving this time, how much does it mean to you now, uh, have, sitting in that easy chair as we record this, to know that you got to hold tag team gold with Bobby Eaton? If you think about it, it's... I don't really know how to describe it because it's one of those things that you thought Midnight Express will never break up. They just won't. Uh, I thought and knew that the Horseman thing was over, but now you've got something new in the Dangerous Alliance. So I figured something good would come from that. But let's just say you're in the golfing world and in a magical what-if you had, let's just say you were playing partners two on two in golf. What if suddenly you had Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer suddenly magically be on the same team? Or Tiger Woods and Jack Nicholas or Arnold Palmer? All of a sudden, it's like, God, I never thought I would see this. Yeah. And it just. Bobby was, again, I sing his praises, and I'm glad. I see in, you know, some of the responses to the podcast that our audience is glad that, that I praise Bobby. I, guys, I couldn't praise Bobby enough. We could just spend the next six weeks talking about Bobby Eaton, and it wouldn't do him justice. He was just that good, and what a pro and what a human being he was. But, man, all those things aside, he could flat shit and get it. Buddy, and what's so cool here is that your name is the third name as far as he carrying the tag team gold with. The only other two guys at this point, Dennis Condry and Stan Lane, the third person he carries tag team gold with is you, Arn Anderson. And to me, realizing your friendship with him, I just think that's so cool, uh, especially knowing how much you care, cared about him and, and still do and still put him on such a pedestal. I think that's really cool. Well, he's earned it, and uh, he just was just so good. It was just, you know, having your best friend as a partner, very seldom does that ever happen, you know, because if you're in this business, you're together all the time, and that can wear on your nerves and wear on your, you know, just basically your psyche. Very seldom are teams that have been together for a long time are they best friends. They're still great partners. But it's hard to stay, and I can honestly say Bobby and I were, were great friends to this day. I still think about him every single day, just about. I'm sure you do. Well, Arn, for you, we, we talked about Bobby's uh, lineage, right? So it was him and Dennis, then him and Stan, and now, now he and you together. For you, we know that he's your fourth tag team partner that you've won tag team championship gold with. First, Ole, second, Tully. 
And then Larry, who uh, you know we, we've come to know and love and, and have fun with on the show. But fourth is Bobby. And so the tag team title victory brought even more prestige, if you think about it, to the Dangerous Alliance. Because the faction now has Rick Rude as the U.S. champion. You've got your television champion with Steve Austin. Uh, you have uh, the tag team champions. Obviously, I mentioned it, you and Bobby. At this point, it just seems like the Dangerous Alliance has all the momentum in the world. Almost, uh, They have all the chance. I mean, Dusty is playing the hits here. He's tried to recreate the magic of the 80s with the horsemen, but he's using the Dangerous Alliance group as the antagonist to get the new baby faces and the talent over, which I love, man. And by the way, if you guys haven't checked it out yet, Arn, I don't know if you uh, have been able to see it. It aired last night. Uh, we're recording Monday here. But uh, they did an A&E special on Dusty Rhodes. Uh, it was a two-hour special last night. Man, it was so good. They got into his early 90s here and how he was booking WCW. Um, but more of the story was with his family. And it was his reconciliation and with Dustin. And uh, I, I highly recommend, if you haven't seen it, that you check out that Dusty Rhodes A&E special. Funny you say that. We're, we got practice today, Brock and I. We're going over to Lodi's gym and work out for a couple hours. We're going to watch... Watch it when we get back. There you go. All right. I, I can't wait to talk to you about it once you do. Um, so here we go. We have that group of antagonists. Dusty's doing his thing. He, he's just uh, using his genius, in, as, as uh, Dusty used to say. And uh, you have this dreams match scenario going on. You got the baby faces that Dusty chose for you and Bobby. And, of course, the baby face team that he picks for Super Brawl. We've talked about it, the Steiners. And uh, that's going to be the ultimate destination this month that we're going to get to as we continue through this episode. But before we get to the pay-per-view, we're going to talk about a little bit about what else is going on here in February of 92. And I want to begin our discussion here, Arn, uh, by backtracking to January for just a moment to bring up something that we didn't get to talk about last week. And that is, it's what we like to call Christmas Day Part 2 for you, Arn. The termination of Jim Hurd. Okay? Jim Hurd was <laughs> fired. Oh, good. I got a, I got a laugh out of you. Nice. Heard had been in <laughs> Heard had been in charge of WCW since January of 1989, and as we've discussed here on the show, Double A, he was responsible for a number of less than questionable decisions, usually tied to the amount of money the company was paying a performer. So even though so many good wrestling things happen on his watch, and here's a few things: he had the Flair Steamboat trilogy. You have the anointing of Sting. You have the emergence of Doom and subsequently Ron Simmons and so many other events. But Hurd also takes the blame for allowing Flair to leave WCW over a contract dispute. And uh, by the way, Flair would win the Royal Rumble in January 19th and 92 and was the WWF champion during this time. Hurd would be replaced by Kip Fryarn. And uh, I want to know, what did you guys think of Hurd being let go and this change of power to Kip Fry? Kip Fry was as personable as Jim Hurd was and not personable. I mean, he was uh, uh, very easy to talk to. He was a wrestling fan, you could tell. You know, I had one, just really one conversation with him off, you know, off the books, off the record, but just kind of sitting and talking. And, uh, you know, he was a wrestling fan to a degree. Um, and, it, and just my luck, funny you bring his name up, you know, he was put into power. Heard was out the door. There was like everyone was, was having a celebration as soon as we found out, even if it, some of us it was internally. You know, you don't want to get too loud. <laughs> End up, it was just a... <laughs> Uh, April's food joke or something, and now yeah, you're right, really, he really back screwed. <laughs> you go, what a dipshit! Oh yeah, dipshit just walked in the door, and he's still the boss. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just so happens my contract was getting close to coming up, and I talked to him, and I just said, you know, been I'll be here three years. I had a three year deal when it comes due. I Sure, like to resign. He said, "Oh, Arn, come on, of course, can't do this thing without you." So he pumped me up big time. But I don't, he, I don't think he was BSing me. It just so happens that when it came time for my contract to come due, he was no longer in that position. 
but we had agreed on kind of just in just tossing numbers around. How how would you feel about this? How would you feel about that? He said, no, that's definitely in line. We'll make that work. Uh, so he was already, you could tell, way easier to do business with. I think he understood talent more. Okay. He had a better grip on who was what and what they had done and what they're capable of doing and who you need on your crew if you're going to get your superstars over. You know, he just, it was a, it was a more learned guy. He understood the product. Him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And as you said, he wasn't there real long. He had a short tenure before he moved on. But uh, it, I'm sure, like you said, it had to be a breath of fresh air for the talent. A welcome change, if you will. I just wish my, my uh, you know, timing being everything in this business, if my contract would have came due while he was there, I feel like yeah. all the wrongs that Jim Hurd made, all the money it cost me, that would have made it right. So, mm. But, hey, I'm, we're sitting here having a good time, so we did something right. Something something worked out for you. That's right, buddy. Well, listen, let's move on from Jim Hurd and, uh, because I want to talk more about the Dangerous Alliance. It was the focal point of the creative at this point. Dusty trusted the men in this faction to help him establish younger baby faces. And on February 1st, you and Bobby defended your tag team championships against Mike Graham and Brian Pillman. In our first clip of the week, we have the conclusion of this one. We're going to watch it together. And then I do have a couple questions for you, Arn. Um, so here we go. Our first clip of the week from World Championship Wrestling. It's February 1st, 1992. Let's check it out. Two more championship matches will be announced later in this hour for Super Brawl 92. As now Graham, great veteran strategy, trying to work on the leg. But he's overpowered now. He's in the corner of the World Tag Champions. But Graham trying to find out. He's successfully doing so. Oh, and thumb right to the eye. You can see that. He got the thumb right in the eye. And it's blinded by Graham. Tag made. Eaton and Anderson make the exchange here. And this is a well-oiled machine. They have no wasted motion. They take very little unnecessary chances. Double team. Graham now in a great deal of difficulty. Well, he's on the phone again. Assuming he's talking to either uh, Zabisco or Rude, maybe Medusa. Near fall. Graham showing great tenacity. Able to kick out before three. Graham trying to work his way back up. Really needs to make a tag, and Brian Ryan is ready for it. And he made the tag. But beautiful Bobby diverted the referee's attention. The referee's not going to allow it because he didn't see it. In the meantime, they were doubling up on Graham. Brian Bryan in. Great explosiveness from this youngster from Cincinnati. Graham with a snap mare. Graham now going back to the figure four. But watch Bobby, the left part of your screen. Graham is helpless, can't defend himself. And he got mashed. Right in the face with the Alabama jam. And they're going to win it here. The champions win it. Ladies and gentlemen, the winners of the match, the dangerous alliance of Arn Anderson and beautiful Bobby. Well, whether you like them or you hate them, it was resourcefulness and... Dude, you've said it over and over, but Bobby Eaton is just so smooth. I mean, that top rope leg drop, there's no, nobody better. Nobody's ever done it better than him. If you could go back and rewind this thing, and when I had the front face lock on Graham and he was digging, the most subtle thing, this is how partners get after they've been together a while. If you noticed, which you probably didn't, because I doubt if anybody did, when I saw that he was getting close to the tag, I just... Gave it one of those head flops, like, get in here. Well, the camera camera work was not stellar because they didn't show that. Mm. But Bobby, that was his cue to come in. 
which prevented the tag being seen by the referee and allowed us to keep control. Little subtle things like that. So if you have the have the means to go back and look at that part of the tape, it's it's very, very subtle. It's just a, a head flip like get in here. Guys, and if you're watching on YouTube, you can just go back and, and, and check it out here with us. So, man, and that's what I'm saying. Your communication, because you guys had just been in tag teams for a long time, you knew how to work as a tag team. And and uh, even though it wasn't always together, it just seems like such a natural fit to do you. It was telepathic. Mm. It really was. Tony Schiavone said on his podcast that Bobby was one of the best wrestlers that he'd ever seen. But Bob, Bobby couldn't always explain to someone or you know the how or why of, of why he did something. He just did it. Do you feel like that is an accurate statement that uh, Tony makes? That's what a true natural does. Yeah. There's, there's some guys that are just a natural for this business, and they can just go in and just go and keep going and keep going, and everything they do is a response to what has been done before. The, the, the naturals in this business, they just react, and they act or they react, and it's just a natural flow for them. They can't tell you why they do that. Why did I snatch the arm instead of taking the ankle out? They don't know. It was just because it looked like the thing to do. Yeah. It's just so many reps, wrestling so much in the ring. It's just the natural next step, next progression. That's what I do. Bingo. I want to talk to you a little bit, though, here about Mike Graham, because that's not someone that we, you know, we've really talked about or spent time with here. Unfortunately, like his father before him, um, you know, he took his own life. But prior to his death, Arn, Mike was a capable worker and, and, you know, he'd become an agent for WCW. Did you ever cross paths with his father, Eddie, who, as most of our audience knows, was the mentor to Dusty Rhodes? Probably one of the guys that have been as long, around as long as I have, how... I, I'm probably the only guy that didn't come across, you know, Mike's dad, Eddie Graham. I, I just never worked that territory. And in those days, if you didn't go to that territory, you know, you wouldn't have seen him because he never left. He owned the territory. So either you went to him or you didn't run into him. And there wasn't a lot of shows that companies, you know, were blended together. So... I know this, you know, Mike Graham was a guy that had a lot of knowledge from growing up in the business. His dad was one of those that's recognized as being a genius in the business. That's where Dusty got a lot of his, uh, his training as far as thought process and angles and, and uh, all that, you know, or he gives him the credit anyway. So if Dusty says this was my mentor, there's no reason not to believe him. And that's where I was going to go next was Mike. Can you tell us any any fun stories or anything interesting about Mike and your interaction or any memories you can share about him? He just was real. You know, Mike was not a huge guy, but he was salty. Salty as he could possibly be. You know, he had a ton of guts. And he just knew the business inside out. Um, I'm sure he, his dad was bringing him around and probably selling programs or passing them out from time he was 10 or 12 years old and he was always around the business and the best talent would always go through the Florida territory because who wouldn't want to work Florida? Yeah. You know, access to the beach, all the towns, just that whole area was just, you know, and the guys made good money and it wasn't overwhelming trips like, you know, say a Mid-South for Bill Watts, the trips were just unbearable. It wasn't that way. A lot of positives. Uh, and Mike was just, you know, I just knew Mike. Mike and I would go back and forth, you know, a little bit jawing, but it was <laughs> respect, veteran to veteran. Okay. Well, Arn, on the uh, way to Super Brawl, you and Bobby Eaton had a warm-up match. And, yes, I say that sarcastically, and here's why. Your opponents, Ron Simmons and Barry Windham, uh, you two guys had, had been feuding since the fall of uh, 1991 with them. This one was built as a grudge match thanks to the history Wyndham and Simmons had with the Dangerous Alliance. Uh, we're going to take a look to see what happened here with this one, Arn. You guys were challenged on February 23rd, 1992. This is the main event. Uh, so let's take a look at you and uh, Bobby against Ron and Barry here. Let's check it out. You, Ron Simmons and Cactus Jack have a big match coming up at Super Brawl. <laughs> Shoulder and down goes Ron Simmons. And Simmons, a man who has had an injury also, 
And you can better believe Cactus Jack's going to work on the injury as well as Arn Anderson right now with the left arm. Was injured. And Anderson going right at it. The World Tag Team Champion. Double teaming Ron Simmons very effectively here. Fans also want to remind you, on the outside, we hope to have a report from Super Brawl. We hope to have a report next Sunday here on the main event. Shoulder first to the ring post. So make sure you tune in the day after Super Brawl. In one week's time, here on the main event, hopefully we'll have a report. See who won, who lost. Count out, it's fine. Count out, same as a pick. Well, Paul Lee wants to get this match over with. Arn Anderson gets the tag back in. And he goes to work right on the shoulder. Simmons. And the ropes. They collide. I think Simmons got the worst of it. It may have been the back of Anderson's head to his forehead. But neither man been able to move much right now. Simmons closer to his corner in this tremendous grudge match exclusively on TBS. Windham in. With Bobby. Valerian. Both men go back. Irish whip. Back body drop. And that right hand heavily taped to the face of Anderson. Wyndham, I don't know what he's going upstairs for. There's nobody there. Here comes Bobby. Oh, the, the Lariat off the top. He got it. He got it. Anderson. And now the Cruncher in. Dustin is in. He followed him in for me. Locker room area. We've got a six man. Nick Patrick not disqualified either team right now because two men are in. Justin Rhodes followed the cruncher in. They're going after the cruncher. It's retribution time, and Nick Patrick's going to let a pin happen right here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the winners of the match, the team of the All-American, Ron Simmons and Barry Window. All right, Arn, so what started as a tag team match turns into a six-man tag match, and... Uh... Look at your face. Go ahead. Say what you're thinking. When did that become a six man? <laughs> it just, it's just Larry that popped in all of a sudden, Nick Patrick's like, all right, we'll make it a six man. How often does that happen? Uh, probably never? should never happen. Right. I, I mean, that's creative Liberty at its finest. <laughs> Exactly. And Larry, our old pal, he takes the pin, even though he was the man that beat Bruno. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but seriously, this is a unique way to finish this one, dude. Oh, Arn, I just came in to give you a hand and they ended up beating me. What is that all about? <laughs> My God. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but listen none of you got you and bobby don't look weak at all in this one and it can and it helps to continue the storyline here between sting's allies and the dangerous alliance so i guess that was uh that was the the creative plan here in this one well those guys were probably the favorites if you look at on face value barry windham was you know still at his best around this time simmons is on the way up we were you know we're the champions we were, we were pro they were probably favored mm -hmm. if you really looked at this talent wise it was a it was a huge huge match and uh the talent involved was top notch not only that, I, I, every time when I see Barry, I see Ron. You're working with Bobby Eaton, and, and you're getting to work with some of your closest friends in the business, which I think is really cool, too, in this era. To this day. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I mean, I sat beside Ron just backing up at uh, WrestleCon, you know, a couple weeks ago, and we were sitting there for three days, and I got to enjoy his humor and, and stuff. He's funny, man. He, yeah. Ron Simmons is funny. Or, oh, 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 damn. Right.
right and 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 to your point i was going to say i'm sure he says more than damn too yeah that's oh, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 it, it was good seeing him with, do the uh, wwe hall, hall of fame induction uh he came out and said a few words but uh hey listen three months into this run with the dangerous alliance how gratifying is it our knowing that you're being featured in the top spot again after a very turbulent and very political 1991 yeah, it's, it's good to just be used on your merit. I don't want any gifts. I don't want any special you know, treatment. Just give me a chance and put me in a position to make your product better. And of that, I think I've always been capable of. Hey, guys, need to call a quick time out here. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my listeners over at OU didn't know for a while now about all the cool things happening over at adsfreeshows.com. He created the soundtrack for generations of WWE fans with some of the most iconic themes in history. Legendary composer Jim Johnston sits down with Conrad to take us behind the themes that we all grew up on, including Randy Orton's Voices. Got you rules and your religion All designed to keep you safe But when rules start getting broken You start questioning I wanted it to be a little bit creepy. Right. That's what it felt like to me. Is uh, dark, mysterious, creepy. That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ads Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adsfreeshows.com. Arn, on February 29th, a video package aired on World Championship Wrestling previewing your Super Brawl 2 match with the Steiners. And uh, this video package gives this match a big fight feel. And I'm so thankful uh, to our guys behind the scenes because they grabbed the package. And we're going to take a look uh, at it together. It's our third clip of the week. We only have four this week. And it aired on World Championship Wrestling on February 29th, 1992. This is that big fight feel video package telling the story. Uh, between you guys, you and Bobby, against the Steiner brothers. Let's check it out. And beautiful Bobby of the Dangerous Alliance tonight at Super Brawl 2 for the World Tag Team Championship. Fans will see two of the most prolific teams in WCW history. The Steiner brothers are the most honored duo ever in WCW and have defeated the sport's finest teams. The brothers from the University of Michigan have won championships around the world but were stripped of the WCW World Tag Team title when Scott was injured and had to undergo major surgery to repair his bicep. While the Steiners regrouped, Anderson and Eaton won the tag title and began a very successful reign as champions. Double A and Beautiful Bobby have met WCW's best combinations and have continued their winning ways. No team in the sport has won more titles between them and no combination can match the champion's technical knowledge of tag team wrestling. With the Steiner brothers back at full strength, the Dangerous Alliance knew the threat posed by Rick and Scott. During a tag team battle in Kansas City, the Dangerous Alliance took drastic measures to eliminate their challengers. And now Rick Steiner, after dangerously, but in the ring, pretty predicament for Scott Steiner, the Alabama team off the top. Then we get the cover. Zabisco, oh my, they spiked him in that brain buster. Rick Steiner spike, dropped right on his head. Oh, fans, the Steiners have been left laying. They've been hammered by the Dangerous Alliance. And then a few weeks later, Anderson and Eaton were in a tag bout, and because of their brutal actions, the Steiner brothers came to the ring to intervene. Again, the Dangerous Alliance seized the opportunity to attempt to eliminate the awesome Steiners. They're not going to wait until Super Brawl to get their hands on the world champion. Beautiful Bobby in the lights. Anderson with a Steiner line, and down he goes. Tilt the world on beautiful Bobby. The Steiners are dominating here now. Here, wait a minute. It's the pressure.
tonight at Super Brawl 2, the Steiner brothers once again attempt to regain what they never lost in the ring, the coveted WCW World Tag Team title. But awaiting them are two of the highest skilled tag team wrestlers ever, the champions of the world, Arn Anderson and Beautiful Bobby. Will the Steiners regain the gold or will the champions prove that they are unmistakably WCW's best? Steiners understand their own press and actually believe it if they listen to the people on the street they're probably sitting there right now just a few short hours from match time eating late probably reading magazines relaxed I don't even know if they'll run off and remember to bring their gear because they're so relaxed everyone says we can't win so I guess the best thing Bob Eaton and I can do as the champions is bet on ourselves and clean up we're gonna shock everybody shortly Anderson Eaton when you said so when you're a little kid your mom used to tell you don't be afraid of the water don't be afraid of the dark and don't be afraid of the boogeyman well Anderson Eaton when you get in the ring I put you in the skull and look, you taste that blood run down the back of your toe you got something else to be afraid of beautiful Bobby and Arn Anderson later at the night in Milwaukee Wisconsin we're gonna prove to you who the best tag team in wrestling is you guys Get ready for some violence. Man, what a what a package, Tony Schiavone. Kudos to Tony. Great job putting that together. I mean, I talk about a, a build and telling the story between you guys. I mean, they position the Steiners as the most dominant team, having never been beaten for the tag team championships. And then, uh, you know, then they have you and Bobby being, you know, put on a pedestal as far as being the best and most successful tag team wrestlers in the business. You just got to love what you saw here, Arn. That was a good. That was a good package. Really, really well done. I thought, and it made it. Well, you know, going into the match, you know, you don't really know who to bet on. You know, it's hard to bet against the Steiners, that's for sure. But I think Paul said in one part of the clip somewhere, "Hey, we," just, and maybe it was the previous clip, but it was, "We don't have to win. We'll take a count out. It's the same as a win." It, uh, it really ratcheted up the personal issues, but then it also built both tag teams up as, you know, you have the unstoppable Steiners, but then, you, hey, you can't, you can't sit pass on this incredible tag team duo that has now formed because they're the two best tag team wrestlers of all time coming together. So uh, that was a lot of fun, and I think as fans, it really gave us, if there wasn't enough of a reason, more of a reason to tune in. Uh, so lots of fun there. I got to ask Arn though, as we head into this match, was there any conversation that you and Bobby had that you can recall, uh, concerning this match or, you know, a lot of high expectations. I'm sorry. This is super brawl too. This is a big pay-per-view. Uh, it's hard to prepare for the, for somebody like the Steiners or doom or the road warriors or guys that just Man, they just come out and plow you. And I don't think they have an order of priorities in their head. They're just going to come in and, and bite your head off. And, you know, as far as Bobby and I, we knew that we couldn't match them with strength. Power, no way. Just wrestling ability as far as amateur slash professional. We were, you know, those guys were just, they're in a different league. So... Teamwork, cutting yeah. off the ring, one of those things to where you get one of them something hurt. Get, you know, even as strong and physical as they are, anybody can get an ankle broken. Anybody can get an elbow chipped. Uh, you know, you can get something injured, and now the whole thing looks entirely different. That was probably the discussion we that we had because Scotty had been out injured. He was coming back. So what was that injury? How can the we bicep. Put him? Yeah, that's right. So how do you get him in a position? That's tailor made mm -hmm. for me. If anybody can work on the left arm, I know how to do that. And uh, a lot of tools out there: ring ropes, stairs, posts. And once you get one of them hurt, now it's not two and a half against two of us. Now it's maybe it's one and a half of those against two of us. You're right, though. It's already built in for you. The injury. Because of the injury, you know now exactly the strategy, right? Attack that body part. I would think so, yeah. Well, Arm, we've arrived. It's Super Brawl 2. It was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, February 29th, 1992. You had 5,000 fans that watched the event that night. And this is the first pay-per-view where Jesse, the body Ventura, uh, served as the color man for JR's play-by-play. -play. 
And uh, the Dangerous Alliance was featured in three of the final four matches that evening, and uh, save for the main event. In a tag team match, you had Larry and Stunning Steve. They took on Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham in a losing effort after Windham hit the clothesline on Zabisco. That match went 18 minutes, 23 seconds. Then you have Rick Rude, who wrestled Ricky Steamboat for the U.S. title, and he retained the title when a band from the ring, Paulie Dangerously, came to the ring late into the match, dressed as a ninja, Arn, only to use his phone to help Rude win. And uh, Rude gained the pin at 20 minutes, 2 seconds. What a rivalry, by the way, that uh, Rude and Steamboat had during this time. But based on the roster at this time, was there a better heel, babyface matchup than Rude and uh, and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat? Uh, probably not. But before we go forward, any further forward, this was the 29th of February. Was that a leap year? It was, yep. The 29th of February, it was a leap year. See, I caught that. So you, you did. Think, You're paying you attention. You didn't think I was up to snuff and mm -hmm. was just kind of floating along here? Yeah. Which means on a leap year, anything can happen. That's right, especially the day of. Yeah, a show yeah. on the day of, are you kidding me? Yeah, so, you know, maybe we kept that in the back of our mind. If you need a miracle, maybe it happens on that day. Ricky Steamboat and Rude, were, that was a great money angle. Because, you know, Rick was a great heel. Uh, Ricky Steamboat, maybe the best baby face of all time. So, and superstars in the business. Arn, guess what's back? Fans are asking questions this week. And Brad Stanton, our old buddy, he wants to know if you would recommend the Steamboat Rude matches for current young talent to watch and study. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, they didn't get in a hurry. Nothing got through away. Steamboat selling is legendary. And Rick Rude, you know, he had a he had a style. He never varied from that style. He had the same five or six things that he would do. He looked the part. I mean, what a physique on the guy. Mm. And it was just a just a good versus evil, wonderful matchup. Now, if you think prototypical, like you say, good versus evil, it doesn't get any better than Rick Rude. And uh, we're going to see more Rick Rude next, week, next week's show, too. Uh, he was on fire as a heel at this point. And then he can't go wrong with Babyface Steamboat. So uh, great match up here. But before we get to your match, a couple more things to note on this card, uh, Arn. They opened, this Super Brawl 2 opened with a light heavyweight championship match. Uh, between Flying Brian Pillman and Jushin Thunder Liger. And Arn, this match is regarded as one of the best light heavyweight matches of all time. These guys went 17 minutes, Arn, and they tore the freaking house down. If you guys haven't seen this pay-per-view, I would highly encourage you to go back and watch Super Brawl 2. Uh, at this point in your career, 10 years in the business, countless matches and even more miles under your belt, had you ever seen a match like this before with Flying Brian and Jushin Thunder Liger? Nope. Nope, and I, I just sat there with my jaw on the ground. It was wild. I, I remember this very clearly, you know, for all the 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 sheets and, and the book, you know, the wrestling magazines yeah. and just, just pretty much wrestler, hotline, whatever it would be. They said that this one stole the show. It's hard to argue that fact. Friend of the show, Ted the Hillbilly Heel, wants to know, what could today's young high flyers learn from Liger versus Pillman in terms of their, in terms of their in-ring development? Sell it. Mm. <clears throat> if you're going to do something that looks like you risked your life to do it and then you execute it, make it pay off. Don't let it be the same thing as a clothesline or a slam or a punch. Uh, if you're going to do something that you're going to risk the rest of your career because, in essence, you know, the difference in uh, hitting one of these spectacular moves and missing it and plowing your head through the mat is probably about that much. So if you're going to go that far, please make it uh, serious and make it something that changes the course of the match. You're not kidding, man. The high risk stuff that goes on now. We just saw uh, a few weeks ago now. Dante Martin just shatters his, his leg, his ankle, you know, high spots. And these things can easily happen to anybody. The, the stuff they're doing. So at least put them and have them positioned in a match, 
And and Dante's a good kid, very respectful. I hate that he got hurt, but put them in a position in the match where they're going to put you if you were losing badly and your momentum had really switched to the other guy, at least let it have an effect of a momentum switch. Mm-hmm. That's all I ask. Put it in a strong position to change the course of the match to your favor. Yeah. Scott Golden asked, how did you feel about the Liger and Pillman uh, match? Did you think this style would change the sport in future presentations of professional wrestling? Not really, because they were two of the only guys that could work that style. It wasn't like you had a locker room of them to, like you have today. It was special because they were two of the only guys that could have pulled that off at that time. At the time, yeah. So it was more of, hey, a special attraction type match versus, hey, I think this is where the future of the business goes. Well, they got a niche and they yeah. got, yeah, they've carved themselves out a niche for all those that thought they weren't big enough or they weren't this or they weren't that. Well, there were plenty of everything. They just had to have an opportunity to, to showcase their talents. Well, Arn, finally, the main event of this show featured Lex Luger defending his championship against Sting. This was Luger's last night in WCW until September of 1995. So uh, there you go. February 92 all the way to September of 95. And we remember when he showed up at the first Nitro. But uh, he had dropped the title to Sting in just over 12 minutes. Luger, then he goes on, joins Vince McMahon's World Bodybuilding Federation, the WBF, and he spent one year before debuting at Royal Rumble 93 as the narcissist. Arn, you helped groom and teach Luger. You spent a lot of time with Luger and the horseman and in the early part of his career. Five years later, he was the trusted guy as Ric Flair left the company. And Nick Lenz wants to know, what was your reaction when you found out Luger was leaving the company to work for Vince McMahon? Did you give him any advice or have any kind of discussion with him about it? No. Um... I'm sure we didn't have that discussion before he walked out the door. That was kind of a surprise and a best kept secret, I think, that he was leaving. It wasn't, you know, that wasn't clear that he was going to work for Vince because he was still under a contract, right? He had a, yeah. probably a, a year's contract or That's something right. left. That's why I did the WBF. Yep. So when he went and started doing that, then it all, you know, because it was totally. He was making a living outside of the business. The two did not conflict. So that was a smart move. Luger was a smart businessman. He, he knew how to market himself and, and feature what he brought to the table, which was that incredible look. You know, if anybody looked better than him at that time, I don't know who it would have been. I'm surprised that Dusty, you know, didn't maybe try to entice Luger or have him, you know, hey, maybe consider staying with the company. I mean, he had an incredible run as the U.S. champion, longtime challenger. He's eventually the world champion here, so you know he was liked. At least it seemed to seem like that for us as fans, but who, who knows what happened behind the scenes. Well, I think, and it probably came true for him, um, the upside was the marketing was on a different level. Yeah, for WWF. Yeah. It just was it was two different animals and the potential he could have probably made as much as whatever his contract was to wrestle. Yeah. You know, because in side. those days yeah. they were pumping out the lunch boxes and the ice creams and <laughs> you name it, it could put a likeness on it, they were selling it. Yeah. And that's you know, and when Vince talks to you, he can you know, you he can convince you the world is flat. You know, if you let him, he's he's pretty sly and pretty clever in his presentation. And he probably, you know, made when Lex left that meeting, it was probably something that was uh, something he couldn't turn down, something yeah. he couldn't refuse. Yeah, that no, makes sense. Well, let's close uh, our discussion here this uh, week, Arn, with uh, finishing up Super Brawl here. We're going to watch the conclusion, our final clip of the week, of the match between uh, with you and Bobby against the Steiner brothers. And uh, we're going to take a look at the closing moments of this match. It went 20 minutes, by the way, 20 minutes, 6 seconds. Uh, so let's watch the ending here together. Gives him the opportunity to throw Scotty over the top rope, out on the rampway again. That rampway has been a real battleground here tonight. Backbreaker by Arn Anderson, and all this being done Uh-oh. outside the ring, and here goes beautiful Bobby. Beautiful Bobby up top. Here comes that rocket launcher. The rocket launcher.
center. And Scott Steiner rolling off the ramp all the way out to the floor. Beautiful Bobby even shaken up a little on that one. There is virtually no give out on that rampway. The execution of the rocket launcher, somewhat suspect, but the effects were not. It was very conclusive that Scott Steiner is now badly, badly hurt. Bobby's head into the security railing and now his shoulder into the rampway and it was eaten with a thumb or a finger to the eye. Scotty reaching out to tag his big brother but it's Eaton that makes the tag and will make the exchange with double A Arn Anderson. And again Scott Steiner been in the ring far far too long any hope, he better get over and tag that idiot brother of his. This match for the Tag Team Championship of the World. The Steiners got to reach down. They've got to. We got a race now. Who can tag first? Scotty tags in ball face. Rick Steiner and Arn Anderson, the legal man in the ring. The Steiner line. Steiner's literally taking on both of them. Beautiful Bobby and Arn. And Arn comes up from behind and catches him. And oh, is this turnabout. Great counter move. If they can execute it, they may put him away here. A cross body. He caught him in midair. And he... Oh, oh. My God, what a move. He caught him in midair on Anderson's shoulders and slammed him. Anderson caught in the face and dog face again, along with Anderson, the legal man, bulldog up the top, but beautiful Bobby with a kick to the back of the head, and For now Scotty's in. Fortunately, Bobby Eaton was stuck in the ring and was right there to deliver a blow. Medusa just gave something to Anderson, the powder or something, it got in his eye. It's some type of substance. Oh, look at that. Steiner suplex the ref. Steiner was blinded. Maloney, that's a disqualification. You can't touch a ref under any circumstances. He didn't know he did it. He couldn't see. It was inadvertent. Scotty Steiner with a power bomb. Anderson and Rick Steiner are legal. No way. This should be a total disqualification. And Arn, that is what we all call the dusty finish. Had a lot of swerves, didn't it? Oh, man. I mean, listen, you had, uh, we only saw part of it, but it was action-packed. Rick hit the belly-to-belly -belly suplex as a reversal coming off the top. The superplex and the power moves from the Steiners. And uh, as I said, the dusty finish. Some fans might, might not like the finish. But, uh, buddy, it helps It helps build the heat against you guys, and it allows for you four to continue telling stories and proves that you and Bobby can defeat the Steiners, which coming in, that was the big question mark. More importantly, it gives fans a reason to buy a ticket to subsequent shows. Hello? What are your thoughts uh, after seeing that one? Well, <clears throat> if you look at it as being hokey, I get that. But 
if you think about it, Steiner got blinded, which yep. was behind the ref's back. So the next person he made contact with, he couldn't have seen. He just thought it was another participant in the match bumping into him. So if you break it down piece by piece, when he chunked Randy Anderson, I was waiting for whiskey to fly out of his ears when he landed. Uh, when Pee Wee took that bump, it was like, oh my gosh, hope he didn't kill himself. It was not pretty. But when you unravel it and JR talking you through it uh, and the governor taking the other side, you know, so Jesse. Yeah, perfect. You know, they they cleaned up what you were watching and explained to you what you were watching if you lost control. Okay, who's who's legal? Who's this? Who's that? They caught you up. Jr. was great at that, you know, putting in details. Okay, here's what happened, and he'll catch you up real quick. So he was, was great wild. on it, watching it live, not knowing what was happening. He was so spontaneous. Yeah. that's the magic of Jim Ross. Yeah, he was he was really on top of his game at this time. Well, Lauren, that was a fun way to end this week's show, but we're not done because we got a few questions uh, from our listeners that I want to go through, and we're going to close it down uh, with our first pal. The, he loves that history of WCW book. He's back, Brian Haremza, and uh, he asks, several of your matches involved Dusty Rhodes being tied to Paul Lee at ringside. Was there any thought of having Dusty come in and wrestle at this point, or, or was he more there for his name identity? Star value. Star quality, that's all. Uh, you know, it's hard to book and, and, and be talent to. And, uh, but just putting him out there and tying him to Paul Lee, which means you just completely took Paul Lee out of the equation. Dusty's not going to allow anything to go down. They knew that. But having to match even, any further, I don't, I don't think that was ever even discussed. Bryant with an even better follow-up question. On February the 9th from his book here in 1992, Elegante was a referee for a death match between Barry Windham versus Larry Zabisco from the Omni. Elegante was a terrible wrestler, but Arn, how was he? Was he good as a referee? Also, how does he even enforce anything? <laughs> Number one, it was a death match, all right. It killed the town, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure the audience oh, were all man. looking for something sharp to cut their wrist with. <laughs> yeah, pencil to put in their eye. If he couldn't wrestle. You know, being a, being a referee is a lot harder than you think. Well, I'm sure. I mean, because what you end up doing in my limited experience is you get caught up watching the match and you forget you're an official. Well, Elegante, you know, wasn't real brilliant, and he didn't have a lot of aptitude for what we do. To suddenly be able to referee, mm. bad booking. I, I can't imagine seeing him spring around to try to make three counts. Or can you imagine trying to watch him keep up with some false finishes nowadays? Okay, let me see here. The Tommy Young dive over the top of the pile. <laughs> He'd have killed everybody in the, in the, three states. <laughs> At least the first three rows. They would have uh, wiped him out. <laughs> It'd have killed everybody. Are you kidding me? Oh, man. The professor, Drew Landry, wants to know, what is the business like at this time? Did Ric Flair try to tell you to come back to WWF? Did you know Luger was jumping ship? And if so, what did you tell him? So kind of interested as, as to what was going on back then. He's right. Flair's gone. Luger, he's he's jumping ship. So what was it like? Well, you know, I, I was where I wanted to be. I wasn't, there was never one day that I thought I should have stayed. I'm telling you. No, not you were happy. One. You were I happy. I was thrilled. You know, what I had just been through up there and, and, you know, we go back and relive it. But I think everybody at this point by doing the WWF stuff has a sense of just how difficult it was to work there. I mean, just it was not travel friendly. It was not politics friendly. There was everything negative that you can go through. We went through. So I wasn't budging. I wasn't going anywhere. You were happy as happy could be. You Scott betcha. Golden wrote, the Steiners were known for being stiff. Could you explain the line between snug, stiff, and unsafe in the ring? Placement. 
you can clothesline me as hard as you want, and, and I'm not a tough guy, but if you hit me in the chest, you're not going to kill me. But when you hit me in the teeth, now we're talking stiff, and that's either a, a big mistake because there's a couple of things that are off limits. Nuts, teeth, dropping somebody on their head where you break their neck. There's a few things that are you just stare away from. And if you cross that line, it was either a really bad mistake or you just don't give a shit. So when it happens a second time, you know this guy don't give a shit. And that's mm -hmm. the difference in snug. Snug is just good, solid contact because the audience... You know, if you're going to chop a guy, chop him, light him up. Let me see a handprint on his chest and a deep one and a deep red one. Otherwise, if you're not hitting me enough to leave a handprint, I'm not going to sell it for you. Uh, so, you know, punches, kicks, everything like that, they have to be snug, but they need to be placed where you're not going to kick my teeth out, you're not going to kick me in the balls, anything like that. Unless you're, you're intended, unless you're intended yeah. to, and if yeah. you're intended to, that's a different story. Now we sometimes, got a different fight on our hands. Yeah, no, sorry to cut you off, but so, sometimes too. What about? Have you ever been or experienced? And I don't know how they pull this off. I mean, they do a great job, but when they do go for the below the belt, the nut shot, the arm up between the legs, has that ever really connected? Where you're like, okay, so too close to home. Yeah, well, some people aren't qualified to do any number of wrestling moves. And I'm sure there are those that have saw it, you know, the Mexican uppercut, as it's called. <laughs> and some can place it where they don't cripple you. Some can't. And the ones that can't should stay away from it. Never do it again. That's correct. You take uh, them to the back behind the scenes and say, okay, my turn to try it on you, pal. It may not make it to the back. It may happen later in the match, just depending on how much match is left and you can get it, get it together in time to do something about it. Yeah, if you stop seeing stars. We have a few questions from our friends on Twitter. Dan Barella wants to know if anyone in the locker room was unwilling to take the Frankensteiner. That could be a scary move. Yeah, it was. Uh, it really was. Uh, I don't know. I didn't take it that many times, but a few times, and Scott was... Very safe with it. Uh, ironically, the first time I broke my neck was working with the Rockers in WWE, and that was uh, just a mistake. I didn't get tucked. It was a victory roll, which is the same thing as a Frankensteiner. So it can go wrong. In my case, it did go wrong. It was the first chink in the armor, but uh, Scotty never landed me bad. He always got me tucked, and that was – he had to do it. I couldn't do it for him. So, mm. Francis Reyes asked, did you feel at the time that the Steiners were an all-time great tag team in WCW? Uh, I thought they were pretty pretty, uh, pretty good up and up there in the rankings already. They just, uh, you know, and in those days, they were doing a lot more amateur stuff, or Scotty was, and it, it diversified, you know, the things that they did. You know, Rob was, Rick Steiner would just come in and knock your head off or, you know, suplex you from anywhere or power slam you for anywhere. He was just, but uh, Scotty had a more diverse mixing some of the amateur stuff in there. Jake Jones wants to know, what's up with all the white ring gear? Mahogany. Got to show off that damn skin, right? I've told you, it's this is the quote, and it, if you look right now, if you look on our screen, fat looks better brown, period. That's it. Yeah. So? And nothing makes that tan pop like white. Correct. And there you go. Uh, Trevor Owens wrote, I assume you and Bobby lead the match. If other teams have a new move, how do they communicate that with you? Say that one more time. He said, I'm assuming you and Bobby led the match. I guess he's talking mm -hmm. about the match here with the Steiners. If other teams were to have a new move, how do they communicate that with you? Uh, we would know. We would figure it out. We would, uh, you know, that may come up in a, in a match or it may not depend on what the move was and how it fit with the story being told at the time. But, 
you know, if somebody did something really, really cool and the audience had gravitated towards it, certainly we would want to have it during the match. So we'd figure out a place to put it. And if it's the comp, if it's your competitors, if it's the Steiners, for instance, that say, "Hey, we want to try this," is that something that would happen ever during a match, or would they figure out a way just to communicate with you behind the scenes before the match if they wanted to try something different that maybe you haven't tried at a house show loop or something like that? Well, it just depended. Uh, are you at TV? Or are you at a place? Or are you at a sure. house show? Where so you it just depends different... on the situation. Yeah. You know, if it's, you know, if you're call in the match you would just plug it in hey want to do frankenstein around here frankenstein or question mark yep okay o or no or maybe later but you're the one who's in charge you make the call as the heel was it yeah at the time yeah yeah boink the clown closing it down with this one arn what's the worst rib arn ever heard of or personally saw executed by the steiner brothers I can't probably talk about some of the worst ribs that those guys ever did, but they would certainly tape somebody to a chair. Uh, that was probably the most common one. They would literally, if you were sitting in a chair, just come in and one would get behind you, one would get in front of you, and you kind of knew what was happening. And they would tape you to something or take your bag and maybe suspend it from the ceiling and wrap it with tape or something. And, uh, you know, uh, there's not much you can do about it either. When those two big boys are, are doing what they want to do. Well, I told a story and I don't remember how far, how long ago it was. This was a rib. If you look at it as a rib, Bobby and I are driving down to Macon at 75 South from Atlanta. It's usually, not a lot of traffic back in those days. So it's maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. And uh, it's just straight interstate. And I'm looking in my rearview mirror, and I see this little speck car way, way back there. So I don't think anything about it. Nobody's on the road. And I look back again in a few seconds, and that speck is getting bigger and bigger. And I'm thinking, oh, no. Surely this ain't a cop. He was sitting up a ramp, and he's going to cause. I usually cheated a little bit on the speed limit. I have to tell the truth. Uh, and I look up again, and that thing, now it's in the lane behind us, and there's nobody in the left lane. So if he's going to go around us, he probably should start getting over. And I look up one last time, and boom, we're ended. We're doing about... 75, 80, and I look, and it's the Steiners. <laughs> they go around us. They're laughing their ass off, and 80 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour, I just back off. Now, that would be considered a rib, probably a dangerous one, but <laughs> that's the Steiners. Man. And they don't care. Was it a, just a rental car just wreck it in the back of somebody? Two rental cars, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, and, and you know, the damage wasn't bad. It just whew, scared the shit out of me, though, I can tell you that. Oh, I bet. Well, Arn, on that note, that's going to conclude our coverage of February 1992. Next week, we're going to continue the walk through the Enforcer's careers. We're going to discuss March 1992. The Dangerous Alliance and the Baby Faces escalate the violence. That's right. The Steiners continue their quest to become the tag team champs. Two new heels emerge to challenge Sting and Vader and Cactus Jack. And we'll talk about the woman that will kick your head off. If you, get, if you forget her, and that's Medusa. We learned that. And uh, listen, don't forget, you can access all things Enforcer by going to arnlinks.com. Once there, you can find all the links to our social media pages, previous episodes in the show, and uh, you can find both the Four Horsemen and the Arn Show stores. That's where you're going to find these jackets and a T-shirt like Double A is wearing. Also, you can find our YouTube page there. Like, subscribe, turn on all notifications at youtube.com forward slash Arn. And by the way, if you want to advertise with us, that's right, advertise with Arn. That's also where you can find us, advertisewitharn.com. And uh, if your business targets 25 to 54-year-old men, there's no better place to advertise than right here with the Arn Show. 
You've heard us do ads for some of the same companies for years, and it's because it works. We have a super targeted audience, and it, there's very little waste. So check it out, advertisewitharn.com now, and find out more about advertising with The Arn Show. Arn, the other thing I want to talk about real quick is ad-free shows, man. They're still running that free trial, and you can get ad-free access, early podcasts on demand, starting at just $9, and the first week completely free so check it out adfreeshows.com and you'll get some cool live experiences like you're going to get here on the show in a few weeks we're going to do another ask arn anything and we like to do those live uh, with our friends on ad free they jump in and we have a lot of fun with them so check it out now adfreeshows.com buddy that's going to do it for this week's episode thank you uh, for walking through february 1992 with me Things are heating up. I'm enjoying reliving it, that's for sure. Nah, man, there you go. Well, listen, on behalf of the enforcer, Arn Anderson, this is Paul Bromwell, and we'll see you right back here next week on another episode of Arn.